All right, so this will be part two of the Why Autistic Men Love Video Game Series title pending, uh, because I may change the title to something else that's more uh, inclusive, I guess. But if you watched the first one, then you probably already, you know, locked in, engaged. You're already committed to the course of action, so to speak. So I guess the title becomes irrelevant at that point because now you have to finish the series. <laughs> I mean, you should finish the series anyways because it's uh, quality. So last time, do a brief little recap. Uh, last time we talked about six principles. I think I counted to five last time, but as I said in other videos, the math is not really my uh, strong suit. Anyways, the principles that I will be going over in this video will be immersion, dopamine, accomplishment, competition, community, and failure. But this time I will be talking about the dark side of these aspects that make video games so attractive to autistic individuals, but especially autistic men. Start from the beginning, immersion. The problem with immersion, right, is there's always the possibility that you are misqualifying your time and your energy playing these video games when you could actually be doing something that is way more productive and something that could be way more fruitful in real life. So you got to think about the time investment that you really make when you are a serious gamer. Um, all right, you know what? I gotta take these glasses off because this is not, oof, it's not, it's not giving what it's supposed to give. I gotta take those off. Uh, I'm gonna make my int stat go down, but that <laughs> is what that is. Anyways, so as I was saying, you are investing this time and you are investing this effort into becoming the best at whatever video game you're playing. And like I said, this is potentially, well, certainly taking time away from a real life pursuit that could possibly, you know, put you in a better position to like make more money, you know, improve your physique, uh, improve your interpersonal relationships. Because the thing about life is it's all about decisions. You have to do this or that. You can't do this and that because you only have so much time and you need to prioritize what it is that's really important. So to make a long story relatively short, the dark side of the immersive aspect of video games that we love so much as autists is definitely a potential serious issue uh, when it comes to procrastinating things that could really improve us. And unfortunately, no matter how many hours you put into a game, it's part of the distraction matrix. And if you don't know what the distraction matrix is, well, I, I'll put a link because I've talked about it before. So I'll put a link to my video on the distraction matrix that I made like forever ago. So that is what that is. Moving on, dopamine. As I said in the last video, you do receive dopamine from achieving certain things in video games because it, it activates the primal parts of your brain that you're getting a reward. You're putting in an effort, you're getting some kind of reward that is a you know visual representation of something but the problem is with these feedback loops right the fact that something you are doing externally outside of yourself is triggering a dopamine activation in your brain means that it's literally addiction <laughs> this is how people get addicted to games and once you get addicted to that feedback loop, you start thinking emotionally. And the thing about emotional thinking 
is emotional thinking makes you spend money. I'll tell you a secret about human nature, right? For the most part, when human beings spend money, it's because they are not thinking logically. Like, the best way to become a good businessman, salesman, entrepreneur, whatever, if you want people to finance your dreams, ideas, etc., you have to become skilled at getting emotions involved. And as I said, not to get off topic, not to get off subject, but with these video games, they are using all of these things like music. Music appeals to the subconscious mind. Music does not appeal to the logical mind. So you play this game and every time you accomplish something, you experience a certain sound. And so you start to associate that sound with accomplishing something. You associate the sound with something positive, you know, like this. Right, so if you know, then you know. So they are basically getting you addicted to the positive feedback loops within whatever game it is that you are playing. And once you're addicted, then you're going to be willing to spend money, whether it's DLCs, which in my opinion, DLCs are not that bad. But where it does become a issue is when you are playing something like a gachapon game, and then that's all bad. That's all bad. Like, and I am a gacha. I am a gacha enjoyer, but like, I ain't, I ain't no whale. I'll tell you that much. But I am no stranger to the RNG. Anyways, these games are getting you addicted to dopamine through using these feedback loops that appeal to your emotional brain, not your logical brain. So, I don't know. You may or may not have already have known that, but just keep that in mind. The next thing accomplishment once again the problem with accomplishments in video games is that number one the game can always end especially if you're playing a online server-based game servers shut down you know the bills if the bills ain't paid the lights are getting cut off and this happens and it's never a positive thing because you have invested your time, money, energy, built friendships, whatever. But when, when you get that notification that says, in the service, you're cooked. <laughs> you're cooked. You're never going to get anything back other than the experience that you had. You know, so just be mindful of the fact that any accomplishments that you have in the digital realm can just be taken away just quick. And there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. So yeah, there's that. Always be aware of that. And the other thing is, let's say that you're playing this game for a long period of time. Everything's going fine in the game, but there's really not much that you can do within a game that will ever really translate into real life. The best case scenario is that you are able to make some kind of career out of being good at the game. So you become a YouTuber, you know, you become a streamer that's, you know, successful to the point where you can do it full time and make enough money to pay some bills or at least afford some hot pockets you dig what i'm saying like come on man but uh <laughs> for most people the amount of self and energy that is put into these video games is forever relegated to that space like there's no real life translation or real life benefits directly. Now, I realize as I say this, there are some sorts of uh, benefits, but that's actually gonna be the subject of the next video, which is how to translate video game sort of things 
and concepts and ideas and functionalities into real life. But that's the next video. That's not this video. So, you know, but I will talk about it in the part three of this series. Moving on, competition. So this aspect of competition is kind of iffy because like I said, as men, um, we do like to be competitive. We do like to succeed. We do like to triumph over other men in different arenas. And, you know, video games appeal to that. But the elephant in the room, <laughs> the problem is that, like, <sighs> you, you might suck. Like, you just might not be good. And, you know, if you have ever, like, like, say, for instance, I wrestled in high school, right? And one thing is, once you get to a certain point, I call it the middle ground. Like, once you get good enough to start touching and interacting with the people who are at the top of a given thing, oftentimes you realize that you're never gonna be number one. You may not even ever be top 10. And once that consciousness sets in, like I simply don't have the skills to pay the bills. And, and like, after you really like dedicated so much of yourself into something to realize that there is a ceiling that you cannot break, a glass ceiling, you just can't break it. Like you can see the top of the mountain and you can see number one, number two, number three. You're watching their replays. You're watching how they combo. You're like, oh my God, Woo, they cold, man. They cold as hell. Like you just watching them like, like how can a human do these things? And you're just like, man, I'll never be able to do that. And it's just like that sets in and you're just like, sheesh. So that's the dark side of competitiveness is just realizing sometimes that like, you're never going to be, you're never gonna reach a certain level. Like no matter how much hours you put in no matter how much you practice and that can be debilitating if the game really means a lot to you and like once upon a time maybe you had dreams you know maybe you had dreams of being the best but like you just can't like sometimes you just can't like there's a certain level that you can get to and then beyond that like you would have needed to be chosen by fate <laughs> basically it like, it just is what it is. Like, honestly, it just is what it is. Right, so that's competition. That's the dark side of the competitive aspect. All right, now, moving on. Community. Communities that you can find within these online video game environments, they can be good. Some communities are very toxic. And, you know, the toxic communities can even be toxic in ways that are outside the realm of video games. And that is the issue. Like you may be a part of a gaming community, but you know, maybe they like, uh, maybe they like Lolitas or something crazy like that, or, you know, like feet or, you know, and I'm not, I'm not shaming anybody that likes feet. But I am shaming people who like no leaders because you know, you know that's weird. You know that's weird. But uh, yeah, like, you know, they could like weird stuff or you might get into like some type of alt sort of political sphere or, but basically I'm just saying the people that you spend time with in these communities like may lead you to some dark paths. And it's just like, this is just something to be aware of, especially because of the fact, you know, that people who are on the spectrum 
tend to have a issue with fixed thinking, like black and white thinking. Like it's it's hard for people who are on the spectrum to grasp subtlety sometimes. So a lot of times it's either this or that. It's either black or white. So if a person on the spectrum gets into certain spaces and certain groups and certain ways of thinking, like it's really, it can be really difficult to get out of those, you know, I'm, I'm intentionally being very vague because I don't want to trigger anybody and I don't want to offend anyone because that's not the point of what I'm trying to do right now. The point is like, just be mindful of that, that this is something that can come with, you know, video game communities is, you know, falling down the rabbit hole and that's not good. Finally made it to the last point, which is failure. And when it comes to failure, I'm about to tell you a story, right? I'm about to tell you a story. It's a little bit, it's a little bit embarrassing, but it is what it is. So when I was at the tender age of perhaps 19, 20-ish, maybe a little bit older, maybe a little bit younger, time escapes me. But I was around this younger age and I had finally gotten a hold of my first PlayStation. My first gaming system was actually, my first console gaming system was Sega Genesis. And I was on 16-bit gaming all the way until like, I was really behind with getting consoles for a long time. But I got a Dreamcast, and that was my entrance into 3D gaming. So it's kind of crazy because I didn't have a PlayStation for a long time. I got a PlayStation after I got a Dreamcast. So it's kind of crazy. There was a lot going on. But anyway, I, was, I became a PSX gamer, and I finally got a hold of Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> I got a hold of Final Fantasy 7 and I was playing it without any cheats, hacks, whatever. I didn't have a game shark for it uh, until a bit later. But I was playing Final Fantasy 7 and this is about failure. I played Final Fantasy 7 and I got through this one, this two, this three. I think it's through this. I got to the end of this three. I'm about to face the last boss of the game, Safer Sephiroth. And that man was too safe. And I'm not gonna lie. I got cooked. <laughs> I got cooked. I'm not gonna lie to you, I got cooked. He kicked my I was mad. Ooh, I was mad. I was enraged, like autistic Hulk. <laughs> I turned into I turned into the big psychopathic. I saw the red. I saw whatever. I was big mind for big mind, and I broke that game. <laughs> I took. This was back when this was back when we were doing CD gaming. I took that CD out of that PlayStation, and I said, <laughs> "I broke that. I broke it. I broke it. I broke it into tiny pieces." So yeah, I broke it. I broke Final Fantasy, and it can be that serious sometimes. Like it's really not. It's really not. But it was at that moment for me. Like so, failure. You know, I failed. And I weirded out and, you know, there's tough, tough titties, right? But yeah, so failure, like sometimes we fail at games and it, depending on what that game means to you, how much you've invested into it, you know, that can feel like failing at life, even though it's really not. So that's the last principle, like 
failure. But yeah, this is kind of lengthy, but it'll probably be a bit more uh, entertaining than uh, the last one was because uh, sort of sleepy. Well, not really sleepy, but I'm tired and I'm tired, like mentally, uh, I would call myself mentally exhausted more so because it's like the middle of the night. We won't talk about that. <laughs> we won't talk about that. Uh, so yeah, that's those are the subjects that I wanted to cover for this video. And in part three, as I said, I will talk about how we can apply things that we learn from gaming into real life. And I hope you tune into that video as well. Like if you watch part one and part two, like it's really unlikely that you won't watch part three. Cause I mean, come on, like it's a trilogy. Like it, the mind likes these things, you know, it likes things in threes. But yeah, that is what that is. Hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you didn't watch this video first. If you did like that, well, you know what? Even if you did watch this first, just go back and watch the actual first part so you can see why. And you can kind of see how it all goes together. And you know what? Maybe when everything is said and done, it'll probably be in a way where you can watch them in any order and they'll still all come together and that would be cool. That would be esoteric in fact. But yeah, anyway, hope you enjoyed this video. You know, like, comment, subscribe, all that silly stuff. If you made it to the end, like I don't see why you wouldn't anyways. But yeah, all right. So till the next time, keep it cool.